Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. His mercy endures forever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We will now hear the testimonials from the Secretary of the College of Bishops, or at least Bishop Labar representing the Secretary, and the President of the Standing Committee. Your Grace, I hereby certify that the College of Bishops of the Anglican Church in North America, meeting in Janu on January 10th, 2019 at Prince of Peace, Melbourne, Florida, did elect the Reverend Andrew Thomas Williams to be the Bishop of the Anglican Diocese in New England. Most Reverend Father in God, I hereby certify that the 10th Annual Synod of the Anglican Diocese in New England, meeting on November 17th, 2018, at All Saints Anglican Cathedral Amesbury, Massachusetts, did elect the Reverend Andrew Thomas Williams as bishop. Thank you. Andrew, the canons of this church require that no priest may be consecrated as a bishop in the church until he has subscribed without reservation to the oath of conformity. In the presence of this congregation, I now charge you to make your solemn declaration of the same. Do we have another testimony? Yes. One more. Uh, okay. Excuse me. I, I, I'm not accustomed to charging the stage. My name is Reg Jones, and on behalf of all of us from Trinity Church, I'd like to thank you for coming this morning. We're here to support Drew, and we are delighted in, this, uh, in, in being here with you in this special morning. Uh, in fact, one of my uh, fellow congregants uh, mentioned to me they were thrilled to hear uh, that I would be speaking on their behalf at Drew's coronation. <laughs> so I want to cover three topics this morning. One is, who is the Trinity Church that Drew has led for 10 years? The second is, what have we at Trinity learned about who Drew is? And the third is, what does that mean for the Anglican Diocese of New England? Uh, my name is Reg Jones. I'm a lifetime Episcopalian. I came to faith as a young teenager at St. Paul's Episcopal Church uh, with Arthur Lane and Terry Fulham during those years. Most recently left All Angels Church of New York City in 2001 to help plant Trinity Church 20 years ago. Served on the council for 10 of our 20 years, three in the first decade with our founder, and seven with Drew, uh, most of those as chair of the governing council during Drew's early and middle years of ministry. Now, I hope you'll forgive me if I note that we at Trinity Church are starting to feel like the farm team for Adney. First, you take Andrea Mueller Millard, one of our rock star ministers, and now Drew. <laughs> At least in pro sports, they pay transfer fees. <laughs> now, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who Trinity Church is. 
If we sent Trinity Church's DNA to Ancestry.com, I think you would find three major lineages. The first is the local Stanwich uh, Congregational Church in Greenwich from where we were birthed uh, as uh, the pastor was leading a minute, uh, an evening service there. The second is Young Life as our founding pastor and many of his early staff were trained and were Young Life leaders. And the third is St. Paul's of Darien where during the 70s it was prophesied that thousands of people would go out into ministry around the world and we have dozens of those people at Trinity. Uh, Trinity is a non-denominational church but steeped in Anglican tradition and practices. We're a seeker church meeting for Sunday worship in a local middle school auditorium trying to reach the unchurched to thaw the frozen chosen. The tagline from our earliest days is you can belong before you believe. It's a contemporary and casual style where we celebrate beauty, truth, and goodness through excellence in teaching, worship, youth, and family ministries. In our earliest couple of years, we had a strategic discernment committee that envisioned growth to over a thousand parishioners, which didn't happen anywhere near that in our first decade, as our founder was more of an artist than an executive. Drew arrived to lead our second decade and took us deeper in prayer, discipleship, and genuine Christian community. Under Drew's leadership, he turbocharged a powerful engine for evangelism, pastoral care, and the pursuit of service and justice beyond our walls. Trinity grew from a couple dozen families in our earliest beginning to over 1,200 people today. Uh, by the end of decade one, our average weekly attendance was 200. Uh, as Drew left, it was tripled to over 600 on a Sunday, and we've moved from one service to four services in two locations. Trinity is well known in Greenwich and the surrounding communities as a welcoming community and with accessible worship. That reputation has been buttressed by Drew's frequent blogs, articles, speaking engagements, and daily devotionals. Uh, we've been characterized by the local press as the church without a building, or by some as the homeless church. <laughs> and it is true we've been nomadic because we outgrew the middle school and we've, we've been in other churches, parish halls, the local high school, local hotels, and auditoriums. Uh, in fact, when we left uh, Central Middle, uh, other churches and a synagogue embraced us, a signpost of Drew's ecumenical spirit and the goodwill he's engendered as a highly am uh, admired ambassador for Christ and for goodwill. When we left uh, Central Middle School, uh, we spent some time in the local Episcopal Church Parish Hall, thanks to Drew's good relationship with the clergy. Uh, I still remember my first meeting with my counterpart, the senior warden. I had one question for him. Are we partners or refugees? The answer was a little of both. <laughs> Upon Drew's departure from Greenwich, another local church took up an offering for Drew, and the senior pastor noted, quote, there's no doubt in my mind that of all the ministers in Greenwich over the last 10 years, Drew's ministry has been the most impactful. So let me shift a little more towards telling you about Drew. Uh, Drew was an associate vicar in Chorleywood in the Church of England and a noted author of a book on mission-shaped communities when we found him. Drew felt a call to come to the U.S., went to a conference in Pittsburgh and found Trinity Church through the advice of our own beloved canon, Mary Hayes. One of the elders of the church uh, in the U.K. lamented to me that here we are sending England's finest to America's mission field. Drew stepped into a difficult situation at Trinity as the transition post-founder was somewhat tumultuous. But Drew acted to right the ship with a clarity of purpose and the courage of his convictions. Uh, Drew's always been informed by this wonderful vision of a beacon church. When he left the UK, I'm sure some of you have seen this painting Drew was given, which shows a uh, uh, lighthouse towering and beams of light shining out over every corner of the land which amazingly looks just like the coastline starting in Connecticut up through New England. Uh, but Drew and I, together with the help of many others, made some key decisions in those early years around governance and leadership. Uh, one is we adopted a collaborative model for the governing council 
based upon principles modeled by Terry Fulham at St. Paul, such as the headship of Christ and pursuing consensus by adopting a posture of seeking and listening for God's guidance and direction. As Terry used to say, when God speaks clearly, each one who hears him clearly will discern a consistent message. Secondly, we, we, we rebuilt the staff team. Um, it was a very difficult turnaround situation, uh, but Drew did a great job, and today we have over two dozen fantastic leaders in the gospel ministering in our community because of Drew. That's one of his great legacies. You know, in business where I operate, uh, they say one of the single best hallmarks of a leader is the caliber of the senior team he leaves, he gathers around him. Uh, Trinity, Trinity Church has done a great job there, although we did uh, hire a lot of people from the UK. I, I told Drew uh, this is the most significant British invasion since the Beatles. <laughs> but Drew has always served us as an inspirational leader, inspiring in word and deed, a natural storyteller with a quick wit, an engaging demeanor, and one who demonstrates a sincere, modest, and pure heart. He called us into a deeper walk of discipleship and fostered authentic community in a land of very rocky soil. Now, I'd be remiss um, if I didn't note that some of you may not know it yet, Drew has a secret weapon. Her name is Elena. <laughs> Elena, his wife, who brought Trinity Church wonderful hospitality and a robust, life-changing prayer ministry we thank you, Elena. Uh, one other note of, of Drew's uh, uh, significance to us, um, and perhaps uh, helpful to you as well, our annual budget under Drew rose from 1.8 million uh, in 2009 to over 4 million last year. The number of giving units increased 60%. We had nine consecutive years without a budget deficit. And in 2016, we raised over $9.5 million dollars six million of which was to fund the purchase of our first building, a ministry center. You know, our, our founding pastor used to say, everyone thinks they're committed, but when you ask for the big bucks, most find they were merely involved. <laughs> at our church, Drew has done a great job at getting those involved truly committed. As we transition from a benefactor model where six members of the congregation were half our budget to a partnership model where we have dozens of people who contribute that top half of the budget. Drew has really brought a lot of partners into the fold. So my last uh, topic is what does this mean for Adney? What kind of leadership will your new bishop offer? Number one, he'll offer missional leadership. Uh, Drew is a man of vision with a passion to reach all of New England. He's a natural evangelist who can navigate a hostile, and secular culture with love and self-assurance. He brings a, pro a broad purview, having built formidable ministries on two continents, served on the Alpha USA board, and maintained relationships with notable uh, faith institutions around the world like Holy Trinity Brompton. Now, I don't have to tell you, but I always like to tell my friends in other parts of the country, New England is not just rocky soil, we're behind the Iron Curtain of faith. This is tough, tough territory, and Drew has already uh, shown a, an ability to succeed in, in God's leading in our area. Um, as Wall Street Journal author Dr. Gary Hamill noted, uh, Drew is one of the most innovative Christian leaders uh, he has seen, and that's the kind of leader that we need to reach those who have abandoned the church and call them home, which is what Drew will do. The second type of leadership is apostolic. Drew knows how to build and mentor a team. He can cast vision and inspire others to lead alongside him. He can draw on time-tested lessons from past experience and his current network. Drew introduces creative means through media, music, prayer, and the arts to appeal to those otherwise dismissive of traditional church. Drew is the man called to grow the church in New England. Third and lastly, Drew will be a great shepherd. Um, as, as a noted uh, TV and film writer and producer, who I didn't know would be here today, but actually is. If you want his autograph, I'll introduce you afterwards. He said that uh, Drew did not strike me as a typical Brit pastor, beating the New England rushes for heathens and lapsed Catholics like me. He was non-judgmental, inviting, patient, and really funny. He oozes with kindness, comfort, and an infectious love of the Lord. 
I drank from the spiritual cup he offered me and have never looked back. One other quote I'll share with you from TV personality Kathy Lee Gifford, who, along with her husband, football legend Frank Gifford, is a member of our church. She said, Drew has tremendous communication skills. He is very comfortable on camera and stage, and therefore the audience is comfortable. He never acts like he is the smartest guy in the room, never preaches at you, and always makes you feel that what he's saying sincerely comes from the heart and is just for you. Drew came to Trinity during a very difficult time for our church. He brought a healing presence since the very first week. There's a remarkable humanity and humility about him that people warm to immediately. So in all Drew does, he personifies God's love for each one of us in his flock. Drew is the man called to shepherd his church in New England. And all of Ed Adney's ministers and seekers as well um, will be led to a personal understanding of God's grace and love through Drew. Thank you. So Drew, the canons of this church require that no priest may be consecrated a bishop in this church until he is subscribed without reservation to the oath of conformity. In the presence of this congregation, I now charge you to make your solemn declaration of the same. I, Andrew Thomas Williams, do believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and to contain all things necessary to salvation. And I consequently hold myself bound to conform my life and ministry thereto. And therefore I do solemnly engage to conform to the doctrine, discipline, and worship of Christ as this church has received them. And I do swear by Almighty God that I will pay true and canonical obedience in all things lawful and honest to the Archbishop of this church and to his successors. So help me God. I now invite you to sign the declaration. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is written in the Gospel of St. Luke that our Savior Christ continued the whole night in prayer before He chose and sent forth His twelve apostles. It is also in the Acts of the Apostles that the disciples at Antioch, Antioch fasted and prayed before they sent forth Paul and Barnabas by laying their hands upon them. Let us therefore, following the example of our Savior and His apostles, Offer up our prayers to Almighty God before we admit and send forth this person presented to us to do the work to which we trust the Holy Spirit has called him. As so all who are able, I invite you to kneel. O God the Father, have mercy on us. O God the Son, have mercy on us. O God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. O Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord, 
and that it may please you to grant peace to the whole world and to your church. We beseech you to hear us, Lord. That it may please you to sanctify and bless your holy church throughout the world. We beseech you to hear us, Lord. That it may please you to inspire all bishops, priests, and deacons with the love of you and your truth. that it may please you to endue all ministers of your church with devotion to your glory and to the salvation of souls. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. That it may please you to bless this our brother selected and to send your grace upon him, that he may duly execute the office to which he is called to the edification of your church and to the honor, praise, and glory of your name. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. That it may please you to guide by your indwelling spirit those whom you call to the ministry of your church, that they may go forward with courage and persevere to the end. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. That it may please you to increase the number of ministers in your church, that the gospel may be preached to all people. We you to hear us, Lord. That it may please you to grant us true repentance, amendment of life, and the forgiveness of all our sins. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. That it may please you to hasten the fulfillment of your purpose that your church may be one. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. That it may please you to grant that we, with all your saints, may be partakers of your everlasting kingdom. We beseech you to hear us, good Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear us, O Lord, when we cry out to you. Have mercy upon us. O Lord, arise and help us. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Lord, hear our prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who by your Son Jesus Christ gave many excellent gifts to your holy apostles and charge them to feed your flock. Give grace to all bishops, the pastors of your church, that they may diligently preach your word, duly administer your sacraments, and wisely provide godly discipline. And grant to your people that they may obediently follow them so that they all may receive the crown of everlasting glory. Through the merits of our Savior Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, world without end. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. 
they shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and tend your flocks. Foreigners shall be your plowmen and vine dressers. But you shall be called the priests of the Lord. They shall speak of you as ministers of our God. You shall eat the wealth of the nations, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their offspring shall be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them that they are an offspring the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 100. Oh, be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be assured that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. O oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures from generation to generation. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God 
which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The word of the Lord. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the gift of this day and this time. 
We lift the scriptures to you and ask that you would freshly breathe life to them, that they might find fertile soil in our hearts, that we could become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. And to that end, we offer you ourselves in this time in his name. Amen. Please have a seat. When Drew rang me up and asked me if I would preach, of course I was excited and honored, but I thought it was a little quizzical. Our long-standing relationship goes back weeks. <laughs> and I said, well, brother, I'm glad to do that, but obviously you have something in mind. And he said, well, actually I do. He said, I thought it would be wonderful for one of the founding fathers to talk about our history and where we came from and what's happening in this generational transfer today of leadership from my twin brother to <laughs> ADNA2, ADNE2. And then he said also to bring the word of the Lord. And I said, um, is that all? <laughs> and he said, yes. And, uh, that's challenging, but the good news is my flight does not go back to Texas until tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> so please be comfortable. I'll talk about the history in a minute, but I was thinking over this idea of speaking the word of the Lord. And of course, I knew that what it means is for the mind of God to be expressed to the will of the listeners, but to pass through the heart of the prophet. So if the one speaking is a sailor, you might get nautical images. If the one speaking is a shepherd, you might get pastoral references to sheep. And as I thought about that, I thought back over the years to some remarkable prophetic words that I'd heard. One of my favorites was the prophet who said, I, the omnipotent, omniscient God, as I said from my prophet Ezekiel, or, or was it Jeremiah? <laughs> Passing through the heart of that prophet was a problem. One of my neighboring pastors, when I was had a, a parish, called me up and he said, I had a very interesting prophetic word arise this morning in church. And I said, well, what was it? And he said, this sweet little lady got up and she said, yay, I am ticked with thee. <laughs> and if thou repentest not, I will come after thee. Yea, even with a sawed-off shotgun will I come. <laughs> Definitely interpreted through the heart of that prophet. <laughs> Perhaps they were thinking of First Samuel, where God saw the glory was gone and the name Ichabod was spoken. But this prophet said, I am distressed, I am distressed, I will leave, and when I go, I will write, um, I will write, um, Knickerbocker over this place. <laughs> Not Ichabod, but Knickerbocker. My favorite, though, comes from Bristol in England, where a friend was speaking in an um, a Christian service in the town hall with a big U-shaped uh, balcony above. And as he paused for a breath in his talk from the balcony came the, this word, thus saith the Lord, 
I am not in this place. He processed that and continued with his talk, not acknowledging it. A few minutes later, with much greater agitation, a word broke forth when he paused again for a breath. Thus saith the Lord, I am not in this place. Everyone looked quizzical, but they went on. Later, he said, right after I had made a particularly good point in my talk, the word burst forth again. And this eager prophet said, Thus saith the Lord, I am not in this place, and this time I really mean it. <laughs> Speaking the word of the Lord is a challenge, but it is what we are called to do. Let me turn to Drew's first comment about our history. You know, this is a church which was born out of struggle. Different people awakened to struggle during different times. Perhaps I was late in the process, but uh, others have told me it was early. In the first quarter of 1992, three things happened that shaped my ministry and awareness. The first was I was speaking at a national church, church planting conference and I was the celebrant for the closing Eucharist and I was told, well, things have changed and now in the service, in the Lord's Prayer, you must pray our mother who art in heaven. I did not and strangely was not ever invited back to do anymore. <laughs> then the second thing that happened was I read an editorial by the then presiding bishop who said in his Easter editorial, nothing about Jesus or the resurrection or spring or even new life, but that we needed to discover the holiness of homosexuality because same-sex couples are not rewarded with children as heterosexual couples are, and therefore loving without reward is more holy. And the church needed to learn from that. The third thing that happened a few weeks after that was a meeting with the conservative bishops in our then church, and they asked me if I had any word for them. And I said, I do. I, it is my conviction that if you don't discipline Jack Spong, we will lose the whole church. And they all looked down. There were about 90 bishops at that time. They said, well, maybe you could do it. And I said, I, I'm not a bishop. You're going to need to do that. And you know what's happened. So for me, the Lord was very clear, and he said, get on a plane and go to the places where the church is transforming the culture to become more like the kingdom of God. And you ask them to come and help in North America. Others were doing similar things because it's God's word. Usually when God is moving like that, he'll do it from many different places. So many people were connecting with faithful people overseas. And there are people sitting here who were connected with Kenya, Uganda, Nigeria, Rwanda, South America, where we could learn from godly bishops and archbishops who were transforming their culture. Now we had a few courageous and faithful bishops in this country, but far too few. Last night much mention was made of people like Archbishop Bob and Don Harvey, others who stood faithfully and paid huge prices to begin to gather. But as the overseas leadership saw the context in which we lived, there was a gathering in Jerusalem in 2008 
the first global Anglican Future Conference, which the Archbishop of Nigeria named as GAFCON, a delightful moniker. One of the things that the GAFCON conference did was to give birth to the Anglican Church in North America. So from 2008 to 2009, the preparation work we'd done as a network and as a fellowship of people who were linked under other bishops overseas and a few who were blessed enough to be in diocese, the handful that were faithful in this country. In 2009, 10 years ago, the Anglican Church in North America formed in the US and Canada with 703 congregations, a little over 800 clergy, with a gospel message. The people that gathered together to form the Anglican Church in North America had heard this word from Isaiah, the lesson today, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for the captives, the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Of course we know that that is principally and primarily the ministry of Jesus. But he said to us, as the Father sent me, I send you. So he gives us this same charge. And that is the church that has come to life, the Anglican Church in North America. A church which has the healing balm for what ails the culture in North America. It is not enough that we just stand for truth and say we believe what the Bible says. Jesus says we must also bring to bear the healing word of God. And we must offer to broken people redemption and transformation, always being open and welcoming, but not inclusive of every idea. Now retired Archbishop Moses Tay was the Archbishop of Southeast Asia. Before that, just he was the Bishop of um, Singapore before the province formed there. And besides being a spirit-filled bishop, he is also a medical doctor and a board-certified physician in internal medicine. And he said the church that decides to be an inclusive church is a church that has decided to die. If you want to know whether or not I'm right, go home and drink up everything under your kitchen sink. We cannot just be inclusive. We must be welcoming, but all ideas are not the same. Only the things which are affirmed by the Lord in the scriptures can be our message and provide those things as Bishop-elect Drew just proclaimed necessary to salvation. So we are a people with this message, and then in the gospel lesson today comes the mandate where Jesus has a very simple command for the church. It's not very often that leaders can lead with a single word. But Jesus does it in Matthew 28. Go. My friend Tony Evans in Dallas in the Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship says, I have studied both the Greek and the Hebrew in the scriptures and I have decided, I am convinced that when God in the scriptures says go, what he actually means is go. Don't 
stay. <laughs> Go. I think you can assimilate this message. The message of Jesus is? You got it. That's marvelous. What do we go with? We go with our relationship with Jesus Christ. We go with the scriptures. We go with the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. He says he's with us even to the end of the age. And this message is foundational to our, our founding, our DNA, and our life. Archbishop Duncan captured it when he called on us to plant a thousand new churches. And we've done amazingly well. Somebody said, well, you guys failed. You didn't plant a thousand churches. I said, how many have you done? <laughs> we've got, I know of 388 of them that are thriving. Um, we're on the right track. But as time goes on, there is a need for generational transfer of leadership. The founding fathers and moms of the movement can't be the leaders forever. And so how do we go about this idea of generational transfer? Well, we do it carefully and prayerfully. And as Anglicans, everybody's involved in the process. One day my twin called me and he said, I'm so glad I can call you and talk to you. I've met my successor, but I can't tell anybody. They have to figure it out for themselves. <laughs> so I'm praying that they get it right. Will you pray with me? I said, of course. And not surprising because of wonderful leadership. The leaders and the people in this place were also able to hear what God was doing. And so we have Bishop-elect Drew today who will shortly be Bishop Drew. Thanks be to God. How sure am I that that's going to work? I am utterly and absolutely confident. One of the reasons that I'm so confident about that is the process was good, but then in the transition, where the first bishop of the Anglican Diocese in New England retires and the second takes up the mantle, is the joy in Bill Murdoch over the future and over the choice. What has happened is a setup for success with good roots, good DNA, good principles, but also a blessing from your first bishop here in which he says to Drew, my ceiling is your floor. With fatherly joy and fatherly pride, it is not a spirit of competition that feels threatened by success, but it is the joy of a father in God saying, we will come to the fullness of what we're supposed to do. And that is a wonderful thing. And so Drew becomes Bishop B Drew. And what you'll discover, the profound ontological change that takes place in the laying on of hands, it is not just an office. It is a change of identity. Being a bishop is not what you do. Being a bishop is who you are. And you will continue with this same heartbeat because you were drawn to it because of the DNA in you and the heart that is in you. 
and it will be glorious. Now, to be glorious does not mean easy. There is much to do, and there is dark spiritual opposition. And we must wrestle. But I believe that not only have you been rightly chosen, you are the right person, you are rightly equipped. And Drew, you will prosper in this place, and the people of God will prosper in this place. What is important is that we are obedient to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the head of the church. No matter how costly it is to faithfully follow him, remember this, the fruit of obedience is always greater than the cost of obedience. Always. And now for the word of the Lord. There are some things that I can say with confidence because the church has been doing this for about 2,000 years and we've kind of ironed out the wrinkles on it. So Drew, if you will stand I believe this is the word of the Lord for a charge for you. Soon, brother, we will put on your head a mitre, a hat with multiple points. It is the reminder of the divided tongues of flame on the apostles' heads on the day of Pentecost. Remember that he has set you on fire with the power of his Holy Spirit. He will never abandon you. He will always be with you. And you can rise to whatever strength is needed for the task because he is with you even to the end of the age. At the back of the mitre are two tabs for the church mice here. Those are called lappets. Why are there lappets, tabs on the back? Well, it used to be that when a new bishop was being made, a Bible would be brought to them, the bishop would kiss the Bible, and then the consecrators would take the Bible and put it on the new bishop's head as a reminder that as bishop, he must be submitted to the, power, to the uh, word of the scriptures. When they removed the Bible, they would leave the bookmarks for the Old and New Testament on his head and put the mitre on top of that. An obvious and powerful symbol that the bishop must be under the authority of the Word of God. And so Anglican bishops understand and believe that and are committed to it. So as the mitre is on your head and the lappets go down your back, that mantle of scriptural authority is once again proclaimed over God's newest bishop. Second, there is a cross. It's called a pectoral cross for where it is because it is near the heart. Reminder that we must be in a heart relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just an intellectual one, but we must come to know the unconditional love of the Father and the love of our Lord for us, his grace and his forgiveness, so that from our heart can go forgiveness. And after the years of serving as a bishop, I can tell you there will be many opportunities for you to forgive. It helps to remember that when your clergy are talking with you, if you have a hundred clergy, that conversation is one percent of your life. It is a hundred percent of their life. You will also have a ring. Most bishops' ring have a stone on them. The stone is amethyst. 
If you have good eyesight, you can see the tiny spot here. I have a $23 amethyst in my ring. I hope you're impressed. Why amethyst? The Greek word methusia means drunk. Ah, methusia. Think theist and atheist. Ah, methusia means not drunk. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, for that is the fountain of life that will flow through you. And you know, archbishops and bishops, when we function officially, sacramentally, in confirmation and ordination, do so seated, not because we're old and tired. <laughs> not just because we are old and tired. but because we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places and it is a grand seat worthy of a fine chair from which we lay our hands and confirm and ordain. That ring is a reminder that we do so with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you will also be given a staff not just an office staff, but a pastoral staff. <laughs> in what will be in the spirit, if you have eyes to see it, a profound moment when the first bishop of the Anglican Diocese in New England passes the pastoral staff to the second bishop. Authority for office will be transferred. So I'm about to close, I'll tell you a story from Uganda. There was a diocese for whom the bishop selected a new bishop. He was from a different tribe. And when he arrived in his new home, he was not accepted by the people. They thought it would take some time perhaps, but eventually he would be accepted. The archbishop of Uganda at that time was Henry Luke Karambi. And Archbishop Henry sent a few conflict resolution teams to see if they could work this tr through. The new bishop hadn't even started there, so he didn't have any opportunity to bring offense, but he was not accepted. So three, four teams went over this 18 months. Finally, Archbishop Arambi said, we are going to fix this. He called together 12 bishops and they said, where are we going? And he told them and they said, how long will we be gone? He said, we will be there until this problem is solved and healed. So they arrived late at night after a long drive. Archbishop Henry had a cup of tea and was about to retire for the night when the meetings would take place the next morning. And as he was walking into what would be his bedroom for the night, he stopped and turned around and said, where is the bishop's staff? His crozier, where is it? And they said, the retired bishop still has it. He said, bring him to me tonight and tell him to bring his staff. So they came, very late at night by this time, they came and the, the bishop came and he said, give the staff to your successor now. He did. And they went to bed. The next morning, at first light, there was a large crowd of people outside the house where the archbishop was staying. And he opened the door and they said, Archbishop, we have come with a request. Our request is give us our new bishop so we might welcome him. The word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit to Archbishop Henry had identified the log jam in the transition of authority. 
So when you receive the pastoral staff, it is not only a symbol of authority, it is with the blessing and the affirmation of your fellow bishops and perhaps most importantly in this case, the blessing and affirmation of your predecessor bishop. The way that we should do this. It is a staff for you to lead the sheep. It is a staff with which you can resist the devil. It is a staff with which you can protect the flock. And it is a reminder that you, as a sheepdog of the great shepherd, are called to love and to feed the sheep. Today, Bishop Drew, as you take your place in that apostolic line, God's prophetic word comes to you through those things with which you will be closed, clothed and the prayers of those who love you. And now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be ascribed all might, majesty, dominion, and power as is most justly due both now and forever. Amen. 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 Please stand. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten not made, for all made in the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from be seated. Bishops. Bishops. Brother. The Holy Scriptures and the ancient canons command that we should not be hasty in laying on of hands and admitting any person to authority in the Church of Christ, which our Lord purchased with no less than the shedding of His own blood. So before we admit you to this office, we will examine you in certain articles in order that this congregation here present may know how you will conduct yourself in the Church of God. Andrew. Are you persuaded that you are truly called to this ministry according to the will of our Lord Jesus Christ and the order of this church? I am so persuaded. Andrew, are you persuaded that the Holy Scriptures contain all doctrine required as necessary to eternal salvation through faith in Jesus Christ? And are you determined out of Holy Scriptures 
to instruct the people committed to your charge, to teach or maintain nothing as necessary to eternal salvation, but that which you shall be persuaded may be concluded and proved by the same. I am so persuaded and determined by God's grace. Will you then faithfully study the Holy Scriptures and call upon God by prayer for the true understanding of them, so that you may be able by them to teach and exhort with wholesome doctrine and to withstand and convince those who contradict it? I will do so by the help of God. Are you ready with all faithful diligence to banish and drive away from the church all erroneous and strange doctrine contrary to God's word, and both privately and publicly to call upon others and encourage them to do the same? I am ready, the Lord being my helper. Will you renounce all ungodliness and worldly lusts and live a godly, righteous, and sober life in this present world, that you may show yourself in all things an example of good works for others, that the adversary may be ashamed, having nothing to say against you? I will do so, the Lord being my helper. We maintain and set forward as much as shall lie in you, quietness, love, and peace among all people and diligently exercise such discipline as is by the authority of God's word and by the order of this church committed to you? I will do so by the help of God. Will you be careful in descending and laying hands upon others? I will by the help of God. <laughs> will you show yourselves gentle and be merciful for the sake of Christ to poor and needy people? and to all those in need of help. I will, with God's help. <clears throat> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has given you a good will to do all these things, grant you also the strength and power to perform the same, that he accomplishing in you the good work which he has begun, you may be found perfect and without reproach on that last day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those who are able, I now invite you to kneel. Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, enlighten with celestial fire. Thou, the anointing Spirit, art, who dost thy sample gifts impart. Thy blessed unction from above. Enable with perpetual light. Anoint and cheer our soiled face with the abundance of your grace. Keep far our foes, give peace at home. Teach us to know the Father, Son, and be both to be but one, that through the ages all along this may be our endless song. Praise to thy eternal merit 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Please stand. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. Almighty God and most merciful Father, of your infinite goodness you have given your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and to be the author of everlasting life. After he had made perfect our redemption by his death and resurrection and was ascended into heaven, he poured down his gifts abundantly upon his people, making some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for edifying and perfecting his church. Grant to this your servant such grace that he may be ever ready to propagate your gospel, the good news of our reconciliation with you, and use the authority given to him, not for destruction, but for salvation, not for hurt, but for help, so that as a wise and faithful steward, he will give you give to your family their portion in due season, and so may at last be received into everlasting joy. Receive the Holy Spirit for the office and work of a bishop in the Church of God, now committed to you by the imposition of our hands, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Most merciful Father, send down upon this your servant your heavenly blessing. So endue him with your Holy Spirit, that he, in preaching your holy word, may not only be earnest to reprove, beseech, and rebuke with all patience and doctrine, but may he also, to such as believe, present a wholesome example in word, in conversation, in love, in faith, in chastity, and in purity, that faithfully fulfilling his course, at the last day he may receive the crown of righteousness laid up by the Lord Jesus Christ, our righteous judge who lives and reigns with you in the same Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. Bishop will now be vested and receive some gifts according to his office. Remember that you are always under the Word of God. Drew. Drew, give heed to reading, exhorting, and teaching. Think upon the things contained in this book. Be diligent in them that your growth in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ may be evident to all. In doing this, you shall save both yourself and those who hear you. Be to the flock of Christ a shepherd, not a wolf. Feed them, do not devour them. Hold up the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, bring back the lapsed, seek the lost. Do not confuse mercy with indifference. So minister discipline that you forget not mercy, that when the chief shepherd appears, you may receive the never-fading crown of glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite the congregation to be seated so those in the back can see what's going on.
Andrew, take this staff and watch over this flock of Christ. Receive this cross. Remember that he whom you serve reconciled us by his own blood. Take this ring, be faithful to the bride of Christ. Receive this, this coat, coat. remember, remember clothed with, with the, the fragrance of Christ. Receive this mitre and remember that the authority rests in God's Word and Holy Spirit. I'd now like to invite the Elena to come forward and have the bishop's wives uh, pray for her as she takes on this new role. So as, as they pray for her, I invite you to quietly pray as well.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to ask you to now welcome the new bishop in New England. Bishop, would you like to say a few words? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to sit down? That doesn't mean I'm going to be terribly long. But uh, <laughs> um, my prayer uh, for today, in particular, was that we would gather under an open heaven, and that Jesus would be glorified. And I thank you. I thank you for everybody who has co-labored and traveled so far and prayed so hard to make that possible, that Jesus has met us this morning. And I came across a, a Canadian theologian and writer by the name of Simpson. I'm going to do an ugly job of paraphrasing what he wrote, but he said something along the lines of that God has this wonderful skill, gift of putting his people right where he needs them. And suddenly they are at work and the world notices and the world says, where did they come from? Well, I really believe I have some insight there. From Connecticut to the very top of New England, um, I see staring back at me faces of those who bear the love of Jesus in their hearts and a readiness to go with the gospel. And it is my profound um, honor. I am humbled um, by this call upon my life and the trust um, that you have placed uh, upon me. Um, I am not worthy, <laughs> but I will pray, um, and God is good. So all the time, God is good. <laughs> oh, look, they're very good. They're very good. <laughs> so um, I'm beyond grateful. It, it's an extraordinary thing that I come at this point in, in my ministry so so desirous of a, of a bishop, and I actually found one at the point of transitioning into a bishop, but I'm so grateful for, for Bishop Bill, um, and for a very, uh, if, um, if his floor is, is my ceiling, it's a very high uh, floor. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, last night as they spoke about Bishop Bill, and there was a sense of very big shoes to fill, I could feel my own feet getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and the shoes getting larger and larger and larger. Um, but with God's help, um, we will press on. Because what else can we do uh, when the Lord has handed us such a legacy and such an opportunity for such a time as this? So God bless you and thank you. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us greet one another in the name of the Lord.
water bottle there too. The peace of the Lord. You guys, peace to you. Peace of the Lord. The peace of the Lord. God's peace. The peace of the Lord. Bless you. You're welcome. Not mine. So are you gonna call us to attention? You got some greetings. God's peace. Bless you. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. I think it worked. God's peace. Bless you. Good afternoon, everyone. That's enough having fun now. Let's get back to our seats. How do you call the new bishop back to his seat? <laughs> We have some honored guests here today, today who are bringing greetings from many of our Anglican partners in the other parts of the Anglican Communion. And I want to invite first Archdeacon Dorcas Albrecht, who is the Archdeacon for Kenyan congregations in the Anglican Diocese in New England, to bring us greetings from the Archbishop of Kenya. Buenas if you were. Praise be to God. Amen. Congratulations to our new bishop. Thank you. I bring greetings uh, from the Anglican Church of Kenya and from the Archbishop, um, His Grace, Archbishop uh, Jackson Ole Sapit. The Most Reverend Foley Beach, Archbishop of North America, USA, Your Grace Beach, Reconsecration and enthronement of Reverend Andrew Williams. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ this Lent season. We write to congratulate you and the province of North America on the occasion of the consecration and enthronement of the Reverend Williams as the second bishop of the Diocese of New England. Count on our prayers for your ministry in the Anglican Church of North America. We also thank God for the ministry of Bishop Emeritus Bill Murdoch, whom we, have cons whom we consecrated in Kenya to pioneer the Diocese of New England. We wish him well in his retirement. You are sincerely the Most Reverend Dr. Jackson Ole Sapit, Archbishop of Kenya, Bishop of All Saints Cathedral, Diocese of Nairobi. Thank you and God bless. Next will be addressed by the Right Reverend Cranmer Mugisha from Kisoro Diocese in Uganda, bringing us greetings from the Archbishop of Uganda. warm Christian greetings from the Diocese of Muhabura Kisoro and uh, on my own behalf and on the behalf of the entire Christian community in Kisoro, 
congratulate Bill upon your successful handover ceremony and a welcome to the new incoming bishop. This diocese is a friend to our diocese. And uh, the diocese he talked about when he was preaching is the diocese that I lead when he was preaching. So this is the Archbishop's message. The Right Reverend Andrew Williams, Anglican Diocese in New England, Anglican Church in North America, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> I think I have tried. <laughs> Dear Bishop Andrew, Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the name above all names. I'm very sorry not to be present for this glorious occasion in your life and in the life of the, of the Anglican Diocese in New England. I'm glad, however, that Bishops Cranmer and William Sebagara, who is standing there, uh, could attend and represent me. On behalf of all the bishops of the Church of Uganda, May we offer you our sincerest congratulations for your election and consecration as the second bishop of the Anglican Diocese in the New England. Our churches are linked together in so many ways, but above all, because of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one way to create unity in the church and in our communities, and that is to lift up Jesus. For he said, when I am lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. We also thank you, retiring Bishop Bill Maddock, for, this visionary, for his visionary um, leadership and passionate ministry. We thank him and the entire diocese in New England for ministering to the spiritual needs of the Ugandan community within your diocese and especially for creating a Ugandan archdeaconry. We pledge our prayers and partnership. We pledge our prayers and partnership, and we pledge our commitment to continue preaching Christ faithfully to the nations. To God be the glory. Yours in Christ, the, the most reverend Stanley Tagari, Archbishop of the Church of Uganda, and his signature is on. Thank you. Next, the Right Reverend Andudu Adam Inal from the Kadugli Diocese in Sudan will address us with greetings from the Archbishop of Sudan. Assalamu alaikum. In Sudan, when we come to greetings, we'll have like 30 minutes. We'll be talking about chickens, about gods, and all these things. <laughs> but for the sake of you, I'm not going to do that. Your Grace, Archbishop Foley, Bishop William, and Bishop Bill, and all the bishops and the clergy and entire the community. On behalf of the Episcopal Church of the Sudan, Diocese of Kadugli, we are delighted and pleased to be a part of this holy celebration and consecration of the Bishop Andrew Williams as the new bishop of the Anglican Diocese in New England. We bring you our greetings and assure you our prayers. The work of this office, we know, sometimes is very demanding, especially in this time where the world and many churches denying the basics of the, our faith and the authority of the Holy Bible. But remember that the one who calls you 
is faithful and he will do it. May he fill you with the wisdom from above and understanding to lead his people and bearing fruits in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. People in the Diocese of Anglican in the New England, I want to say congratulations. Bishop Andrew and Elena, congratulations. We pray and wish you well in your new ministry. God bless you. And now we'll hear from the most Reverend Arthur Kennedy, retired Auxiliary Bishop, Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Boston, of which Holy Parish is a member. And the Archdiocese and Holy Parish have so gracefully hosted us here this morning. Our Bishop Kennedy. Thank you, Ave Atque Vale. That's Latin for hello and good health. I am here on behalf of Cardinal O'Malley to extend his prayers and congratulations to you, Bishop Andrew Williams, for being here amongst us as a new leader in the church for the Anglican Diocese in New England. The Catholic Church in the, through the Archdiocese has had very wonderful relationships with the new, uh, new uh, church here in Amesbury. And we look forward to be working with you in the years ahead so that we will be able to find ways to continue the kind of dialogue that we need in order to be able to allow our faith to come closer together and to see the prayer that Christ gives us about the unity of the church can continue to grow in fulfillment. That said, I also would like to give thanks to uh, Bishop Bill for his work, for he has been a wonderful leader in allowing uh, our conversations to continue. And we look forward to the time when he will be able to continue his work as a leader of the church, to building up, along with Bishop Williams, the wonderful mission of the, of the community of Christ, the mystical body that is his head and members. Thank you so very much. The offering this afternoon is going to go to the new Bishop's Discretionary Fund, so I would invite you to give and give generously. Now ascribe to the Lord the honor to His name, bring offerings, and come into His courts.
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own to be given you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you. Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through the great shepherd of your flock, Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection sent forth his apostles to preach the gospel and to teach all nations and promised to be with them always, even to the end of the ages. And therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who are ever singing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent your only Son into the world for our salvation, and by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved. And by his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O oh Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him 
so that he may dwell in us and we in him and bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. And this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him and in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Jesus Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. Still amazes me 
Have one more. 
Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me, I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy song, Messiah said, and all of
wake of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting?
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and to serve you, and faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. All are welcome to the reception that will follow at All Saints Cathedral after this service. The cathedral is directly down the street to your left as you exit Holy Family. Ushers and greeters will be along the way to help you find that path. The reception is being held in both the lower church and in the gymnasium of the school building that's next door to the church. If you need help finding anything, Look for someone with a lanyard that says event staff or event volunteer. The bishops will be visiting both the gymnasium and the lower church at various points throughout the reception. You uh, are welcome to be greeting them in those places. Let them come to you uh, so that you don't have to be going too far between those places. There's a chairlift on the east side of the cathedral. For those of you who are directionally challenged, it's that side of the cathedral. There is no lift available in the school. We ask that all who are parked here in the parking lot at Holy Family be sure to move your car by 2.30 at the latest so that the lot will be empty for the service to be held later this afternoon. Unfortunately, our timing does not permit Bishop Andrew and Elena to stay here to greet as it says in your bulletin. There will be time at the reception for informal photos with Bishop Andrew and the other bishops at All Saints. Formal photos of the bishop and the family and the presenters need to take place here immediately following the service. Those photos and photos of the whole event will be available on the diocesan website soon, so you will have access to great photos. You may take photos from where you are seated, but we ask that you exit to the reception as the ushers dismiss you row by row. Wait for their dismissal. Please make your way directly to the reception and enjoy your conversations there. Go before us, O Lord, in all our doings, with your most gracious favor, and further us with your continual help, that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in you, we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. The name of heaven and earth. Blessed is the name of the Lord. The blessing, mercy, and grace of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Can't help but say 